All right, we'll continue with our um, establishment of the matrix vector uh, weak form. Before we sort of plunge onward, I should um, just clarify some notation. Um, so I know I used um, the following symbol. I've been using this symbol. Um, I probably said what it means, but uh, let me make completely clear. This symbol is since or because. Right. I realize it may be slightly archaic notation that has fallen by the wayside, but I tend to use it still. Okay, so that's where we are. Uh, let's continue then with the matrix vector form. What we did in the previous segment was <clears throat> write out the important contributions uh, that that arise from the weak form um, uh, for for a general element, right? And we consider the two main integrals that arise in the weak form from the the integral that remains on the left hand side as well as the one <coughs> that uh, the one on the left hand side which comes from the stress and the integral that that's on the right hand side that arises from the forcing function. Uh, we wrote these out for general elements. What I'd like to do now is um, take the step of just um, sort of particularizing them for um, the first element, right? Uh, because of the fact that it has that Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay. So uh, note that for E equals 1, okay, we have integral over omega E W H comma X sigma H A D X. This uh, is simply C to E multiplying E A over H E, right, um, times, uh, let me see, how do we, how does it work out now, right, uh, correct, this times, um, minus 1, 1, d 1, e, d 2, e. Okay? Right? And, and you can actually see this in a very simple manner by just uh, taking the general uh, expression for a general element e and uh, recognizing that C1e is uh, not present in the expansion for uh, element 1. All right. Uh, likewise, we get uh, integral over omega e w h f a d x equals, in this case, it's just a scalar, right? In fact, well, actually, all the integrals do turn out to be scalars when we when we complete the matrix vector products. Okay, but in this case, we don't even need to use uh, matrices and vectors. So, the forcing term is just C two E. Uh, we have F A H E divided by two times one. Okay. So those are the contributions from element E equals 1. All right. Um, what we are aiming to do now is um, pull everything together. We uh, are going to use the same approach as we used in going from summations over the degrees of freedom for each element integral, except that we are going to now apply that idea to the sum over elements, okay? And um, in doing so, we are talking of the following uh, 
of the following uh, complete weak form. Okay. So, yet again, recall the finite dimensional weak form. It's this sum over E integral over omega E W H comma X sigma H A D X equals sum over E integral over omega E W H F A D X plus, let us not forget this term that we have uh, not had to worry about for quite a while, right, the term coming from the Neumann boundary condition. So, what we spent our time in doing over the last um, segment was uh, expressing these integrals right in a more compact form using matrices and vectors so what we now have is the following we have the term above implies a sum over e sum over all the elements now um, for the general case we have a form which is which involves a matrix vector product uh, so actually, let me do one thing. Let me first write out the contribution for element 1, okay, the special contribution for element 1. For element 1, we have C to E, but E is 1 for element 1, okay. E, A, H, E, but that is H1, okay, times minus 1, 1 multiplying the vector d1 1, 1 d2 1 okay and recall that when we write d1 1 and d2 1 the superscript there refers to the degree of freedom for that element and the subscript refers to the element number right so this is the contribution from the first element to this integral right to this integral Okay, for the other elements now we have the sum E equals 2 to NEL okay, of C1E, C2E, E A over H E. Um, times this um, very simple matrix 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 multiplying d1 e d2 e okay so those two contributions the special contribution from element 1 and uh, the contribution from that sum E going from 2 to NEL give us that integral that shows up on the left hand side involving the stress, okay, the stress and the gradient of the weighting function. Now this is equal to um, all the right hand side terms and the right hand side terms also I can write as, uh, as follows, right. Again as we did for the, for the integral on the left hand side, I will first write the contribution from element 1. That contribution is C2 for element 1 times F A H1 over 2, where the H1 reminds us that that is element 1, plus a summation E equals 2 to number of elements 
Okay, um, and that summation then is um, okay. That summation gives us um, C one e, C two e. F A H E over two. Okay, all right. Um, we get um, this contribution, and um, let me see. Do we? Um, oh, sorry. We have F A H E over two, and we have F A h e over 2 again, right? Okay, there we go. That's complete. Now, uh, the terms we've written on the right-hand side are the ones that uh, arise from that integral, okay? And uh, the term that we could safely not have to worry about when we were writing out these matrix vector contributions is that one because that appears only at a single point. It just appears at the point on which we have a Neumann boundary condition, okay? Now, we recognize that that term alone, W H at L, has a very specific, very simple representation. Can you think of what it is? It is C2 for the very last element, E equals N E L, okay? So the term that we add on here is C2 for the very last element times the data T, which is the Neumann condition on the traction times the area, okay? This is it really. This is a nice compact representation of our um, finite dimensional weak form. This is everything. One thing that may be useful for me to uh, point out here is related to why we get this simple representation, okay? It's a fairly um, straightforward thing, and it's something that um, you may all already have noticed, uh, but uh, it's useful to point it out, okay? So remark. And this remark goes all the way back to our representation of UH in an element as being the sum of n a, let me write n a as a function, uh, expressed as a function of uh, parameterized by C, times d a e, and also to the corresponding representation for the weighting function. Sum over b, n b, c, C, B, E. All right. Um, of course, it's implied here that X is, uh, so I've written this on the left-hand side as X. It's really X parameterized by C. Right? And the same thing here. The same thing here as well. Okay. So now, observe that uh, so, so this is, of course, for a general element which is uh, written as, which can be depicted as this. Uh, we would have uh, omega E. Here we would have X um, E. We would have X E plus 1. Those would be the global node numbers, right? Uh, and we recall that this comes from uh, a bi-unit domain which is minus 1 to 1, and that is 0. This is omega C. 
right, in the one-dimensional space uh, parameterized by xe. Okay, um, now, okay, so we have this picture and what I'm going to use it to do is to uh, ask ourselves what, ha what form these uh, expansions take for uh and wh if we choose to evaluate these uh, quantities, these fields, at the nodes themselves. 